So my name is Dr. Leela Landowski and today we're going to be talking about cholelithiasis, cholecystitis, cholodocolithiasis and cholangitis. And they sound similar because they are similar and you better find out the similarities and differences between all of all of these and we'll walk through each one and by the end of this video you'll have a pretty good understanding of them. Let's start with some basic anatomy because that's going to be our foundation for understanding all of this. So the gallbladder is located inferior to the liver, so underneath the liver, and it's storing all the bile that's secreted by the liver. So bile is going to be aiding in the digestion of fats and it mostly consists of cholesterol, bile salts, um, and conjugated bilirubin. So basically the gallbladder is like this little storage tank for bile and it helps with the digestion of food because it's releasing those contents um, when it's needed after a meal. So how does bile actually get there? Okay, so bile is being produced by the liver, right? But it's um, traveling down this left and right hepatic duct, um, down the common hepatic duct, down the common bile duct, all the way down, yes, past the gallbladder, all the way down and it stops here at this hepatopancreatic sphincter, which is usually closed. So then it'll just keep, um, I guess, filling up the bile duct and indirectly result in filling of the gallbladder. So it's quite a passive process, really. So really, you could say that the function of this hepatopancreatic sphincter, one of them is to, I guess, fill the gallbladder indirectly, also to um, regulate the release of contents of the gallbladder and the pancreas and also to protect um, these organs, so the gallbladder and the pancreas, from the contents of the duodenum. So for example, it's going to be full of acids and so forth, and it's stopping the reflux of those acids into um, this area, which could then cause chemical irritation and all sorts of problems. So it's doing a great job. Thank you, hepatopancreatic sphincter. Um, it has a few different names, as you can see there, but we will be referring to it as the hepatopancreatic sphincter. So you've had a meal, the gallbladder is going to then contract to cause the release of that bile and it's going to travel down into your duodenum and do its job. Um, oh, on that thought, I have a bit of a fun fact and thanks to the magic of technology, I can quickly make a slide. Aha, so hemoglobin is in our red blood cells, right? Um, it's carrying oxygen. When it's carrying oxygen, it's going to be bright red and when it's deoxygenated it's dark red. Now when red blood cells get broken down the haemoglobin has to get broken down as well. So the first stage of breakdown is it gets converted into biliverdin which is this beautiful green color and then that gets de um, degraded again into bilirubin which is this kind of brownie orangey amber kind of color and you'll have both of those in bile which is why bile is this greeny brown color. So when you release that bile, which is full of biliverdin and bilirubin, and that goes into your gut, the gut bacteria is going to break down the bilirubin into urobilinogen, which is actually completely clear, but then that'll become oxidized or also broken down by gut bacteria. And the breakdown products of that is urobilin and stercobilin. Now urobilin is yellow and it's water soluble. So it'll be reabsorbed. Some of it will be reabsorbed by the gut and end up in your serum, in your blood, which is why the serum is kind of a yellowish tinge. And also then eventually excreted through your kidneys into urine. So that's why urine is a yellow color. And as for stercobilin, well, that gives feces its color. So, you know, when you have a pale clay colored stool, it usually means that there's a problem with your liver. So it's not making enough bile or you might just not be releasing it enough. So there might be a problem with your gallbladder or a blockage somewhere along one of those ducts. Now you might've noticed um, when you have a bruise, they start off red and then they go green and then they go this orangey brown color, right? And so you can see what's happening here. We've got this breakdown of that heme. Okay, so where were we? Okay. <laughs> so when a word's end in itis, it means inflammation. Um, if a word ends in lithiasis, it means stone. And the prefix collar means bile or gall. So um, usually relating to the gallbladder. Um, and collar doco means bile duct. 
Um, and cyst actually means a sac-like pocket. So cystic duct means the duct to the sac-like pocket. <laughs> so they all have a meaning. So cholelithiasis um, means stones in the gallbladder. So yeah, so um, I guess the question then is, how do these gallstones form? Well, um, earlier I mentioned that bile is made up of cholesterol, bile salts, um, and things like conjugated bilirubin, right? So as the bile um, becomes more concentrated in the gallbladder, it becomes thicker and more sludgy, um, and the more concentrated it gets, the more likely that, the, cer that certain things can precipitate out and form stones and therefore lead to cholelithiasis. So cholesterol gallstones are the most common type of gallstones, followed by calcium gallstones and bilirubin um, gallstones. And, and maybe conceptualize it like this. So imagine you've got a glass full of salt water, right? The longer you leave that glass there, the water's going to evaporate and then the, the amount of salt is going to become more concentrated and crystals will start forming. Okay, so the same kind of principle is happening um, with, in these gallstones. So some pretty common risk factors for cholelithiasis are obesity, hyperlipidemia, um, the female sex or you know, being um, assigned female at birth, genetic predisposition. Uh, so for example, having a European or an American ancestry um, and age. We know that pregnancy is also a risk factor because progesterone actually can lead to decreased contraction of the gallbladder. So um, the gall, um, bile is essentially going to sit in there for a bit longer and get more concentrated. Um, and in terms of obesity and hyperlipidemia and diabetes, you know, they're all associated with increased hepatic cholesterol secretion. Okay, And that's going to increase the risk of cholelithiasis, particularly cholesterol gallstones. Okay, um, sometimes people like to call the big risk factors for cholelithiasis the four Fs, female, fat, 40 and fertile. Um, and look, many people with gallstones can live with them without any symptoms, but they only become a problem when they become lodged somewhere or any, anywhere outside the gallbladder, uh, along the ducts, for example. And you can see gallstones really easily on an ultrasound. So with cholelithiasis, uh, a patient can be completely asymptomatic or they can have what we call biliary colic. So let's say you've just had a meal and the gallbladder is like, yes, okay, <laughs> contract. <laughs> and it's um, releasing, trying to release that bile. Um, the force of those contractions can actually cause one of those gallstones to be un <laughs> lodge themselves right in there in that cystic duct. And when they're lodged in that spot, um, it's going to block it and the gallbladder is going to keep trying contracting and it's going to spasm and that's going to cause pain which we call biliary colic. So it's a very sharp upper quadrant pain and then after a few hours when you know the contents of duodenum have like been passed through um, and this hepatopancreatic sphincter closes again then the bile is going to slowly fill back up and eventually pop that um, gallstone back into the gallbladder, right? So the pain is going to go away. So we call that biliary colic. Um, so the pain is going to be intermittent, right? It's gonna be right upper quadrant abdominal pain. It's gonna be worse after meals. Um, and that's because that temporary obstruction of the cystic duct, which is then like popping back into the gallbladder. Now it's usually managed pretty conservatively, uh, but you might get uh, things like ERCP, which is endoscopic retrograde choleangiopancreatography. I think I got that right. Um, and that's basically a procedure which takes a tiny little, um, like an endoscope down and up through the duodenum and will basically go out and pull out that stone. So for example, if the stone was sitting here, it would actually take the device past the stone, blow up a balloon and then kind of push it all the way out. Um, certain stones which are quite um, brittle and easy to break, they might actually get a kind of um, snare and actually crush it and make it break up into tiny little pieces. Very cool and allow you to pass that um, naturally, I guess, as naturally as you can considering it's an invasive procedure. <laughs> 
So, um, you know, if the pain is constant, it's really affecting someone's quality of life, it keeps happening over and over again, then, you know, there might be a conversation about having a cholecystectomy, so having that gallbladder actually removed. Okay, let's now move on to cholecystitis. So let's break down the word again. So we know that choler means, you know, gallbladder. Cyst is referring to the cystic duct. And itis means inflammation. So cholecystitis means inflammation of the gallbladder and the cystic duct. Okay, so let's have a bit of a chat about what's happening here. So you know how I was talking about biliary colic and how you've got this gallstone transiently trapping itself in that cystic duct, that opening to the cystic duct. Well, when the gallstone goes into duct and stays there, um, it gets lodged there, then you end up with um, cholecystitis. And what this can do is it causes this kind of prolonged obstruction and all of a sudden the contents of the gallbladder can't go anywhere, right? So there's going to be bacteria in there, right? But it's going to be a breeding ground for that bacteria that's there. Um, they're going to proliferate, it's going to increase pressure, it's going to cause, uh, you know, end up with an infection and inflammation and going to lead to these um, symptoms of cholecystitis. So some of the symptoms that a person would experience with acute cholecystitis is going to be similar to that biliary colic. You're going to have that right upper quadrant pain, uh, but you'll also have um, nausea and vomiting because it's quite strong pain um, and also fevers so remember whenever there's inflammation then you're going to have fever as well now a really important sign to know um, for a physical exam is called the Murphy sign and the way you perform a Murphy sign is um, or detect a Murphy sign I should say is you're going to palpate the that inferior border of the liver like right where the gallbladder is sitting so push onto there and then you're going to ask the patient to take a deep breath in just going to push down their diaphragm and push down the liver and the gallbladder onto your hand and if the patient suddenly stops breathing because it's so painful well that's going to be a positive Murphy sign and it could be um, a sign of acute cholecystitis so how do you diagnose it? Again, you're going to be probably looking at a right upper quadrant ultrasound again to find those gallstones. And there's a range of blood tests that you could use for a differential diagnosis. And the treatment is going to include things like antibiotics because itis, again, inflammation, infection. And you'd use that ERCP again. Um, and again, cholecystectomy might also be indicated. Okay, let's move on to cholodocolithiasis. So let's break down that, down that word. Cholo means bile. Cholodoco means actually the common bile duct. Lithiasis means stone. So cholodocolithiasis means stones in the common bile duct. So around about here, or it could be anywhere along this entire duct region. So some of the symptoms are going to be exactly the same in that the patient could experience, or well, would experience right upper quadrant abdominal pain but there's a couple of differences and it's based on the location of the stone. So remember, whenever there's an obstruction, it's going to affect everything kind of proximal to that obstruction. So in the case of um, cholecystitis, um, you know, everything proximal, i.e. the gallbladder, is going to be affected. But in this case, everything proximal includes the gallbladder and the liver. So yeah, everything proximal to that obstruction. So now that the stone is in the common bile duct, let's have a look at what's proximal here. So you're going to have those same symptoms associated with the gallbladder, but also new symptoms associated with the liver. So it's going to be obstructing that outflow of bile from the liver. So remember one of those contents, those things that is in the bile is bilirubin. So what you might actually see in a case of cholodocolithiasis is elevated bilirubin in the blood. So because it's, it's not flowing out into the duodenum, so instead of being excreted, it's spilling over into the blood. And remember, it's this orangey brown color. So the person's skin and sclera could turn yellow with what we know as jaundice. And because the kidneys are filtering out what's in your blood, um, it's going to filter out that bilirubin. So you're going to have dark colored urine as well. Um, and this is going to result in changes in liver enzymes as well because this is going to also affect, of course, liver function. Uh, 
again, you'd be using that uh, ERCP as the preferred way to kind of, you know, diagnose and, and treat it and take out that stone. Um, yeah. So let's move on to cholangitis. So let's break down the word again. Choler meaning bile, gall. Angio meaning ducts, vessels. Uh, and cholangio. Oh, yeah. That's right meaning bile duct, right. <laughs> so cholangitis, meaning inflammation of the bile duct. So cholodocolithiasis is essentially going to lead to cholangitis. Um, it's going to lead to this inflammation over time. But there's other causes of cholangitis as well. So let's say, for example, you had something else causing a blockage of um, the bile duct. Let's say there's a cancer in this head region of your pancreas. Well, that's also going to compress and block the bile duct. So you'd end up with a similar patient presentation. Um, so in cholangitis, we've got a stone that's somewhere in the common bile duct. Well, probably a stone, it could be another type of blockage. So that's going to lead um, to all the symptoms we talked about before, but we've also got inflammation, so the itis, okay? So we've got inflammation, which is going to be leading to that fever, uh, we've got this blockage of bile, which is going to be leading to that jaundice. And we call this the, the Charcot's triad. Now, in the case of cholangitis, you might end up getting what we call the Reynolds pentad. And that's really when it starts to progress to septic shock. So you've got the Charcot triad and you've got the symptoms of shock, so the hypertension, tachycardia, and also an altered mental status. So how would you diagnose it? Uh, very similar to the others, um, but you're ultimately going to be using a clinical diagnosis as well, doing blood tests and all sorts of things. And you'd be using probably using ERCP to get rid of the stones and um, cholecystectomy as well. So let's quickly summarize this. So cholelithiasis is the presence of gallstones in the gallbladder. And when they escape briefly, just into that opening of a cystic duct, we call that biliary colic. Now, when they get stuck in a cystic duct, we call that cholecystitis. When it, they pop down into um, the common bile duct, we call that cholodocolithiasis. And when that basically becomes inflamed, we'll call it cholangitis. Now, cholangitis can also happen, as I mentioned, um, when something else is going to block the common bile duct. And we haven't talked about this today, but looking at this diagram, you can imagine a blockage down here is also potentially going to affect the outflow of the pancreas. So um, it will also lead to um, pancreatitis. So let's have a bit of a think about this and wrap it up quickly. So all of the itises involve inflammation. So they'll be associated with fever. And of course, you'd treat them with antibiotics. Uh, the ones that are blocking the flow of bile, so cholodocolithiasis and cholangitis, will be associated with jaundice. All of them will have right upper quadrant pain. In the case of cholelithiasis, it's going to be a transient biliary colic. And the treatment is uh, generally pretty similar, ERCP, potentially cholecystectomy, depending on whether it's indicated. So yes, that's our summary of cholelithiasis, cholodocolithiasis, cholecystitis and cholangitis. We did it.